Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Rohit from uh, Google, and there's Victor. We work on Container Manager at uh, Google. Um, basically, that's all of Container Management on all of Google Suite. Uh, today, we're going to talk about how we manage uh, jobs at Google using containers, uh, what containers means to us, and we'll go through some of the use cases and how we achieve what we try to do. So first of all, um, containers means different things for different people. At Google, containers that we use today is just C groups um, for resource isolation, um, for accounting and stuff. We don't use namespaces today. We are working on it. But uh, retrofitting namespaces into what we have today takes some time. We build a lot of stuff above C groups um, to uh, provide the service and uh, interface that users can see and use. And uh, they know how to specify some resources and get it. Uh, we've been using uh, C groups fleetwide around since 2007. Um, we've uh, progressively added more stuff on it. Uh, but we started with just CPU and memory, and now we do almost everything. Uh, it's everywhere. All our software uh, service runs over it. Platform as a service, if you use App Engine, runs over it. Um, GCER infrastructure as a service runs over it. All our private stuff inside and public stuff runs over it. Um, when we containerize a shared machine, uh, we have asymmetric workloads, uh, workloads that have different latency bandwidth requirement. Uh, they have different priorities. Uh, they have different isolation requirements. For some jobs, we give really good guarantees. For others, not so good. Um, and that depends on what we run there. We have a lot of churn on our shared machines. Some tasks are really small. They just come and go all the time. So we have to manage all that in our container manager solution. Uh, what are the goals for our solution is mainly performance guarantees of some kind uh, at every level uh, to the guy who requires like really low latency to the stuff is just going to get done. Uh, so we have different guarantees for everything. The second goal is utilization. As long as we are guaranteeing the performance metric, we want to push the utilization up as much as possible. Uh, the third requirement is to share resources wherever possible. So not everybody has to um, schedule their jobs with their peak resource requirement. Uh, we try to uh, share some of that so that we can uh, manage peak load. Uh, Overcommitment is kind of follows through from the first two points when we want to have high utilization. Uh, you can't do it without overcommitment. We have to have load that is sort of invisible to the high uh, to the uh, high priority jobs, low latency jobs. That if they have to run, they want to get the system. They can get everything they want. Uh, but when they are idle and not doing anything, we can just pump up the other workload and get stuff done. Uh, we need to run on a very low overhead. Whatever we do, get multiplied by all the machines. So it's really important that we don't have too much overhead. At Google, we have other use cases for containers, like Chrome OS is one. Uh, we're not going to talk about it in here. We're just talking about the fleet-wide uh, shared machines. Yeah, so namespaces are really important to us. It's just legacy reasons that we're finding it a little bit tedious to fit them in. So people have expectation on how their jobs, what they see and what they do. Yeah. Your jobs are obviously set up in different ways that don't require namespaces, or you have an alternative technology you're using in place of namespaces. Which is it? Both. Both. And we will, I think next year, hopefully, we'll come. We'll tell you all about namespaces at Google. <laughs> Not this year. <laughs> We don't have a huge. We don't have a huge amount of migration currently, so we don't need containerized IP addresses. And then we also have our own internal reference addressing scheme for jobs that is not IP based. Well, separate file system you can do with the chirp. You can do, you can use a chirp for a separate yeah. file system. You don't need a namespace for that. Yeah. So some of the things we work around internally, but we do need namespaces for some of the things that we want to do. So definitely, it is on, on the table. And, uh, before we leave, tell us what technology you're using in place of namespaces. Think of it like DNS for Google Jobs. So basically, it's, it's, DNS it's, not, it's not quite spoofing, but it's, it's named, named jobs. 
Yes. Exactly. Yes. We have a named addressing scheme for jobs. So another thing about the namespace is, is from my understanding, like there's two main force to getting the namespaces into the container. One is the migration from my understanding. And the other is like the user interactive mode. So you, you create a container, you create a namespace, and you give some privilege to the container. So user can log in and play around it. It's not kind of the common model in Google where it's major like all the containers managed by the sysadmin. So we don't give out, yeah, we don't give out this, the privilege to the user. They can play with it. So that's another reason I can think of. It, it, it's not quite that they're batch jobs. It's more that they are um, headless jobs. So this is um, how a shared Google machine kind of looks. Um, we have like front end job and back end job, which are both high, uh, which are both high priority, um, uh, low latency. Uh, back end job is slightly less uh, critical than the front end job. Front end job is basically somebody sitting on the other side, somewhere in the world, and waiting for this thing to come back. Um, Backend job is just slightly more relaxed. Allocation is an example of uh, what I was telling about peak usage. We can pack, you can take some resources on a machine as an allocation, reserve them, and then you can run jobs there. As long as all of them don't peak at the same time, you can build up some resources so you don't have to pay for peak of every of these three resources, three jobs inside. Uh, you will have a buffer that they can share between each other. Um, there's some jobs that care about I.O really a lot, and the other jobs don't, they just CPU and memory is what they really need. Um, so we treat them differently. Uh, all of these jobs, when they run, we measure how much they're doing, what they ask for, and what they're using. And, uh, and over time, we try to reclaim resources from them, the stuff that they're not using. And that's where we fill out all the jobs that are pointed underneath, which are batch tasks that don't have that strong guarantees. Uh, uh, there are two different type of uh, put them there. Some of them are soaker jobs. They don't care at all, even if you starve. And they'll just stay around and get stuff done when they actually wake up. Uh, the other ones uh, have some progress guarantees that they need to make some forward progress in a longish time. Uh, so we kill it. <laughs> or we compress it or uh, limit it. Depends on what resources can to we, we, uh, we take too much of. The, there's two things. There's, there's two real cases, right? One is uh, whether you want the job to be strictly work conserving. And mm -hmm. we do support modes where you can say this job is strictly work conserving and it will not go over its all allotment. The other is where you want the job to be able to consume idle cycles on the machine. Right. We don't use, the, we use MemCG these days. We use MemCG. Uh, so with respect to memory pressure, it's, we, will, we will identify the working set of the job, and then we will potentially give it more memory based on whether we think it will run better. Um, but we don't, like, we, there are, we rarely explicitly kill the job. When a job dies, it's usually because it ooms or it... Uh, so Yeah. Uh, well, no, we have explicit scheduler support for managing their scheduling. So we, we have both. We, 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 don't, it, we do not attempt to influence their scheduling via memory or um, network. Like we, 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 don't, we, we, we treat them as independent parameters. We don't try to manage, influence scheduling decisions by <coughs> forcing their text pages out, for example. When that happens, it's inadvertent, not on purpose. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so that's what I was showing. There's uh, a big chunk of the I/O is reserved. This is reserved for jobs that are really sensitive to I/O, and we don't run too too many of them on one single machine. And uh, we use the block I/O priorities to manage uh, whatever fair share dealing we need to do for the remaining jobs. But there's also the proportional I/O secret that Vivek and some other people from Google can yeah. too. So this is a disk I/O. So network I'm not covering here uh, because uh, it kind of is not that big a problem as this. So I'm trying to go through three things so we can walk around. You can assume it mostly like an I/O. We have some proportional controls, uh, max cap limits uh, that we enforce on every job, and then uh, we do something similar, and then we do stuff which is outside the host. 
and uh, that's not covered here. Uh, a, a very quick answer is uh, the networking secret has the HTTP scheduling and the I.O. groups have proportional I.O. and you can use both of those to manage jobs I.O. Um, so uh, what does the source isolation mean to us? Um, it's some kind of quality of uh, service that we want to provide everybody. There's bandwidth, which means you get fair share. Uh, you get uh, some progress guarantees. Uh, you get uh, you have availability guarantees, like if you ask for a memory and we said we're going to give you, it's going to be there for you most of the times. Uh, we have latency, like you wake up in some time and actually start running uh, when you have some work to do. Uh, uh, we give you allocation guarantees, how long your allocation will take, uh, and access time when you access your memory, how long it's going to take on average. So we kind of build on those things. Uh, there's priority, like um, which job is more important than the other job. We, if, if there's a problem on a machine, we're losing resources, we are overcommitted in some way, we know which one has to go and gets, get evicted. Uh, so there's priority order between the jobs that we are running. Uh, we do a lot of performance work uh, over all the stats we get. Uh, we published that last year, it's called CPI Square, where we measure um, every second performance of every job, dump it into a database, analyze it, and then figure out if out of like 1,000 of your shards of this job, one of them is misbehaving, so we can track which one is like uh, away, like two standard deviation away, and we can bring it back in. Um, so solution for actually managing all this workload, uh, first one is basically good scheduling mix. When somebody sends a job, a uh, cluster scheduler sends a job on a machine, it can look at different parameters and make sure everything will work together across different uh, resource dimensions. So we look at all the resource dimensions, see what will going to work together. We provide some hints back to the scheduler to say, if you give me a workload like this, it might not work better on this machine. Um, we do a lot of hierarchical resource management. Uh, it's for sharing and for uh, maintaining some of the uh, latency guarantees that we provide. Maybe a stupid question. How, how do you predict what resource it's going to need? Does the user say this is going to need a lot of network or how, how do you? Yeah, so users basically specify what they think is the requirement for them and they can tune it and update it on the fly. Um, so the other solution is to maximize utilization across all resources. So if you have CPU bound jobs, you know you have memory, you have some disk I, you have network, you kind of uh, figure out what jobs can run here. And specialize, like if you have a job that's very uh, disk I sensitive, doesn't care about other things, we can change its setting to like get it all the disk it needs enough CPU to operate with those disks, and I don't care about other resources. So if you kind of handle all the resources in different dimensions differently, uh, that gives you some more higher utilization. Uh, no, for not for these jobs. This is all shared workload. We just manage them accordingly. We, have, uh, we get really good guarantees from CFS, so we don't have to actually have different schedulers for different jobs. So uh, one other layer, more important layer, is we, our tasks are kind of C group aware. They know they are C groups, and they can use them. Uh, so when you get something, you can actually, uh, a task can create its own subcontainer and manage its own thread uh, better. So our thread pool library, for example, can take a request, look at it, uh, figure out if it's really important or not, and then put it in a different subcontainer give it more or less resources. So how fully containerized They just like you can ask for a single resource like I just want to manage CPU for this guy or you can go across dimensions. Uh, so we that's how we do it but we um, distinguish between user safe and user unsafe hierarchies and the unsafe ones they don't see at all. And the safe ones are the only ones they see and they can play with. Okay. So the second question, um, how does this use case payments survive in the system being the world order which they're trying to actually get rid of? What's so that's why we are here. Does it not have a solution to anyone delegating anything? Yeah. 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 No, no, no. I mean, there's a really simple answer to this. <laughs> What's system D? We, 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 yeah. <laughs> system D will probably never see the inside of our computers. <laughs> Right. Uh, that's, that is, that will be a 
but so, and we and we've always had a pos. Uh, uh, So there's a lot. Yeah, right. So. So that's why we are highlighting it here that we use it and we use it really, really, like uh, everywhere. The, 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 <laughs> there's something to be clear. There's there's another thing to be clear on. There's another thing to be clear on, right? Uh, Hierarchical and split hierarchy is a separate thing, right? We can still use, have hierarchical usage underneath split hierarchies. Yeah. But there are a few cases where yeah, so that mix becomes difficult. So we have a most list of, the, of uh, sorry. Most of the current discussion is around changing the interfaces to be strictly hierarchical, not around removing those properties. So the, the, interfa the hierarchical interfaces we depend on, we don't expect those to leave. The discussion for us is um, there are some cases where we where users create subcontainers today, which would be tricky with some of the semantics we have for hierarchies. Uh. So, so from my understanding, like there is current C group a discussion. There's two major changes. I think a lot of people kind of like argue about. One is this like we're planning to unify the, the C group hierarchy. So basically, all the controllers will share the same hierarchy, right? I think we got, we will be uh, impacted in this case because for different C groups, well, I mean for different controllers, they're using a different C group hierarchy. And the other thing, as you mentioned, uh, we are talking about to remove the, the C group FS APIs, which seems to be a easy way today uh, managed by the system administrator. That's why we're using it a lot. But later, if we're talking about to remove it, I don't know, like, what this transaction period is going to be. Like, it's definitely going to break all the ex existing users. And I think the current plan is to, instead of using the C group API, and you have to talk to something like a system D. I, I don't know how that's going to work out. There's other things like uh, moving threads around that's going to change. So we're talking to Tejan. Absolutely. So those cycles are functional between threads. Memory is not, right? When a thread allocates memory, it's not saying this is the only thread that uses memory, right? When we give a thread to a cycle to a thread, it's gone, right? That cycle's spent, you never get it back. But memory is this uh, amorphous resource. So, so the thing <coughs> that really comes with a unified hierarchy for us is uh, it absolutely makes sense to have
It is. It's, a it is. But it's, good. it's one of those things that is going to be a push comes to shove when we finally... Taylor has also said he's going to continue supporting it. And he's not going to explicitly block it. <coughs> and so it's going to come push from the shelf when something <coughs> straddles up more. So a question from the back row. Uh, how hard for you it would be to use the DBus interfaces provided by systemd in the new model? Um, we don't even have time to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, basically, I... No. So basically, uh, I went to the system to, uh, talk yesterday to just figure out what they're doing, is they're going to impact. And it looks like they're trying to build something that we have, which is this container management solution. Right now, the problem they have is if somebody comes and writes a share value and it doesn't know what it means for the whole machine. Yes, exactly. So we control all that You're not allowed to write the share. I mean, you are supposed to only go for the central manager. So we already have a central agent which does everything. We are. So yeah, so my question is how hard it would it be for you to, to switch? Exactly. So there we'll are some cases where, so this is another case that's not us, but if you look at Android, uh, Android uh, is pretty aggressive at setting tasks in the background and foreground secret. And I don't think, so what's that? What's, what's that? Yeah. And it's the and same case for, for them doing, an RPC, doing some RPC to another process to have them do that. I think that'll be a non start for Android. It's same for Chrome OS, it works the same so way. I don't think those use cases are being considered. I would argue that you need at least, you need support for more than one process to be able to We need a way to, sup, uh, a support to delegate some of the responsibility to somebody. What about a non-overlapping where you could actually break pieces off the tree and just put it where you want? So you can only do that with the chirp, right? You can do that with the bind map in the chirp. Or the or the 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 mic. So the problem, as I hear it, systemd has with the uh, C group file system interface is that anybody can poke about in it. Well, they, they don't want a shared control plane. It's sort of, it's hard to work out what's going on if anybody can change it. Uh, well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose what I don't understand there is that the C group file system has, just like any, all the other file system, user privileges. And one of the ways we get it at Google is the parts we want to be non-overlapping, we, uh, we you know, chown to a specific user, and only that user can modify those parts, of the, those parts of the hierarchy. Is that not sufficient for systemd? Actually, you're asking the wrong person. Let's ask the systemd people. Why don't you come over here and we'll do a threesome? Oui, ménage à toi. Uh, so, for example, for the real-time budget, once you reconfigure it somewhere in one leaf of the hierarchy, if you don't reconfigure it in the other siblings and upper levels of the hierarchy, uh, things break. So, well, well, the the real-time budget is not <laughs> right. Some things are not entirely hierarchical. No, it, it's not possible to, uh, because the only way to, to fix it would be to move a lot of policy into the kernel. And um, you don't want to do it, because your policy will be certainly different than the policy I run on my, on my notebook. 
And unless the kernel would understand all of that, uh, so there's 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 a requirement for for having for having a central um, for one entity which, which manages uh, the the whole hierarchy, and you either move this policy into the kernel, which brings a lot of code into the kernel, and it's bad for other reasons, or you have. Can a demon that does that. Can, can you give us an example of where a child container can break its parents' behavior? Right, so um, the real-time uh, budget. RT group schedulers are still hierarchical. Well, and you have, to be, you have to have special privilege to use them in the first place. Yes, so you need, but, but let's say that you want to give the user pulse audio rights. But, but, so the entire argument behind control groups having hierarchical support is that the, the support is strictly hierarchical. You should not be able to go outside of your parents' bounds from a child. So this argument that we need to do separate control plans to stop a child from exploiting a parent's restrictions is actually saying that hierarchy isn't working properly in the first place. Yeah, but it also works on the sibling level, right? If you what do you mean by on the sibling? If I have two users and they, are, they have both real-time budget? That's not true. You can create, if you create a, you can always handle that with an, <laughs> this is computer science, you can always put another level of indirection, right? You can put top, le like you, if you have ch children A, B, C, you can have A prime, B prime, C prime, which parent them with the fixed resources you want, and then you can put them with full control in A, parented by A prime, and they can con set whatever resources they want in A without changing, without changing any parameters above them. Right? It's not true that you need to do this for siblings. But the current API supports all of these things. Well, not, not, not in the case of the real-time budget. The real-time C group is completely separate from all of the others. It should not be used to... His argument essentially boils down to the fact that we found a bug in C Yes. Yes. Like, <laughs> pretend that real-time case does not exist, okay. and I don't see an argument for this. And I'm saying, we can take that real-time case off the table, right, because we can fix this. The real-time case is a, a very edge case for C groups. Um, desktops do not use real-time. Servers rarely use real-time. It, it's, I don't understand why you're using this to try to de derive a policy for the rest of the system. It doesn't make sense. I can actually raise you one more. The, the current C group, so suppose you have a unified hierarchy. There is currently in the SCED C group a check that will not let you attach a real-time process to any C group this, that the CPU is co-mounted with. So I can tell you right now what you're proposing won't work if you use a unified hierarchy already because of this check in the scheduler. Now obviously this check is something we would have to remove to have unified hierarchies, but once we're doing that we're talking about changing the properties of C groups for RT groups anyway. Okay, so another example, you hot plug a device, and then you need to reconfigure uh, the bandwidth or, or such stuff, and you are putting a lot of uh, logic into the well, I don't understand why into the low level controllers. Uh, how, how does this apply to split control plans? When you plug in a device, you need to configure some agent needs to configure at some level in the hierarchy bandwidth for that device. Why does user code mounted below that care? It should strictly inherit from its parent. Um, well, I don't know. Maybe, um, yeah, it's for now. Okay. <laughs> Let's switch to the different topic. So uh, I'll send a note to Tejan that we missed him. Uh, so, uh, so this other part of uh, how many read and write we do on a container. For every container, we need to get their stats every second. That's all the stats that can sh show at us. Um, it's about order of uh, ten C group stat read per second per container uh, per machine. It, if we have like hundreds of containers, it kind of grows a lot, and we have a lot of work to do there. 
Um, uh, we need precise accounting for chargeback, so we can push it back to the customers. And the monitoring happens at multiple layers. Once you leave the machine, go forward, uh, go up. So all this have to account for and has to be balanced. Uh, and these are the reasons that whatever we do has to be extremely low overhead and has to be parallelizable so you can get the stats without blocking on one agent to talk to something. Um, so the current solution we're using it, we're calling it let me contain that for you. Uh, this is the lowest part of container management that we use. It's most, mostly just setting and unsetting of uh, uh, container uh, parameters. And this is the layer we kind of open sourcing this week, next week. So it's coming to a git branch to you pretty soon. Um, so it, with this uh, site, we'll also publish and the kernel patches we use internally to manage this. Some of them you might have seen earlier, some of them are considered like too Google specific, but you can look at them and decide. But the tool should work without those patches too. Should be able to take a generic image and run with it. Unless system D takes over this tool. So. Um, we talked about uh, container management at Google in 2011 and we talked about how there are a lot of critical loops that we depend on in user space, and if you don't get to run in time, the latency jo sensitive jobs might suffer or even die. Uh, the kernel folks pick, fixed a lot of them for us, and now we are in pretty good shape, so <coughs> that's no longer a problem. So just on this, could you give us an idea how much more of the upstream code Rule is using now than it was in Plumbers and was it Santa Rosa in 2011? Well, so we're not using fake new, we're using MCG, MCG so. That's like, all of the code is gone. We had a fun day deleting a lot of stuff. Um, so this is one example of hierarchical sharing, um, where you have an alloc that reserves some space and we're running two tasks in it. They have different CPU shares and memory share. It kind of, with unified hierarchy, it kind of works still because you create an alloc container and underneath you create the task containers and they look the same. So it does not break with unified hierarchy, but this is really important for us to uh, balance our resources. Uh, this is another example of managing priority. So there's a C group which is lower priority and the darker one is the one with the higher priority. So if you look at CPU, we kind of put them one level below so that no matter how many of those CPUs, uh, of those tasks exist on a machine, it can't affect the, machine, the tasks at the top level. And that kind of saves us a lot of trouble. We don't have to make sure we have to adjust their uh, shares every time a new task comes in. Uh, even if it did, it will not work. Uh, the same thing we do with block IO. Everything that doesn't have to care about disk goes down there in a, in a separate hierarchy, and it does not touch anything else. Uh, this kind of requires some kind of split hierarchy. We can still work around it in just this particular scenario with these two tasks. Uh, but uh, to implement this, we need some kind of split hierarchy where we say, in memory, you're going at a top level. In CPU, you're going one level below. In disk, maybe you go at top level or one level below. So this is another example which has three different cases. Uh, there's a block I.O. case where it, what is about disk, CPU, and memory. And then there's a case which is just a CPU memory latency job. And then there's a bad job. This one is pretty hard to do with the unified hierarchy. Uh, we also create subcontainers there create a container that has a prior bit set on it, so it has a, a front of line pass for all its IOs. And uh, when we get an IO request, we look at who sent it, if that guy is really important and is, has to get his IO done really fast, we push it through this. So this is another place where we might move threads around to actually get, give, uh, provide good uh, disk IO guarantees. Um, so this is the complete picture of all those things combined together, and this is the use case we have been showing people to say this split hierarchy does not, uh, is required for this particular use case. Uh, we are about uh, currently like hundreds of containers on a machine, and we don't see any issues. Uh, we do kind of uh, hierarchical stuff for, if there's a lot of batch stuff, it just goes one hierarchy down, and uh, the scheduler just manages it. We don't see problems there. 
this is the other case Paul was talking about. We have a lot of users who depend on user subcontainers. This is one example where you have an app engine, it runs a server. Every time you start an app, it creates a subcontainer underneath it, gives it some values and limits, make sure it does not go rug. If it does something really crazy, it'll oom die on its own, and the job has, doesn't have to worry about it. Uh, so this is a model that is used in a lot of jobs at Google. And for this, we need uh, support for a job to create some kind of hierarchies, some kind of user-safe user subcontainers. Uh, and this is what we've been asking for. So I'll cut it short, and uh, the main takeaways are that a lot of people use containers as containerized VMs. You make a container, launch a job, but uh, there are people who don't do that, or not yet. And uh, we stress one part of containers a lot more than the other part. Um, sharing our own equipment is really a key for high utilization. A uh, lot of people don't see that now, don't need that now, but we think like if you go four years down the line, a lot of people will start seeing where they're hitting this limit, and they need to do some more sharing and aggressive uh, behavior. So we think a lot of people will get into the same situation that we are in today. Uh, managing each resource separately helps fine-tune utilization, helps uh, all the other cases. Uh, putting all of them at the same level, managing them in the same policy is kind of very hard. Uh, and it uh, affects latency and affects scalability. Uh, and it's generally a lot of, loss of a lot of flexibility that C groups has promised over the years. Uh, more powers to user means better flexibility and scalability. They can do stuff, they don't have to bother us. They, ha they cut down their latency and we cut down the amount of work we have to do. And that's really important for us. Uh, there are a lot of interesting topics here, so you can just find out. All of us are here in this area. Uh, we can chat about it. We can figure out what are the better ways to do this. Uh, if there are other ways in Unify hierarchy where this will work better, uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Do you have something to show on, on screen? Or? Actually, just so you're clear, over... Ooh, I'll be good. Overcommit has been an interesting use case for Parallels for decades. But we think with the cloud, the ability to sell the same resource to multiple people is going to become an important business model in the cloud as well. And it's actually a use case that hypervisors have difficulty in touching. So this is a use case that is tailor-made for containers, which is why we think containers exactly. are actually going to be important to the cloud. So I'd say it's not three or four years. I'd say it's probably tomorrow. Right. Uh, this is the same discussion we had in the parallel guy in the morning. They said, right now we don't care. If it is a problem, we'll get another rack. For us, if we don't solve this problem, we have to get another data center. So it's a bigger problem for us now, but you'll all get there. <laughs>